Uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> is that mic working for okay, everyone? No? Does you use this one? Is this working? Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Simon Wilkinson. Um, I'm a principal UX designer, that's right, a designer. Um, I work at um, uh, our very own. Um, we're made up of um, uh, UX designers, UI designers and developers. Um, and we sort of embed into organisations to help out and bolster their product teams. Um, and here are some of the places we, we're working at the moment. So we're in at NAB, AGL, Energy Australia, Australia Post. Um, we do work with Melbourne Airport, City West Water, Australian Government and um, Victoria Racing Club as well. So today I want to talk to you about bridging the gap with design systems. Uh, so I want to talk about what design systems are, um, what the value is to, orga to organisations, um, how to create them, how to maintain them, and importantly, how they bridge the gap between design and um, QA. So show of hands, who knows what a design system is? Got a couple, cool, excellent. Um, and all those people, who uses it in their organisation? Cool, cool, cool. All right. Um, so when we look at building a product, we've got a lot of people involved. We've got UX, we've got UI, we've got accessibility, legal, risk, business analysts, devs, QA, all to come together to, to make this, um, this product. So let's just take out the less important people. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, devs and everybody else. But um, so you can see there's a massive gap between UX and QA. Like, like we're at opposite ends of the, um, of the spectrum here. Um, uh, I'm lucky to see one of you guys. Like, um, I rolled off a project way before you started. And so, um, and a lot of stuff in the middle here go, can go wrong. So when I'm, I'm talking about design consistency here. Um, we can have things like um, an accessibility change or a risk change or uh, maybe there's a rogue dev that actually decides that he doesn't like the way that the UI guys design the button and changes it. And so it, it really changes throughout the product, so we've got to be really careful of these things. And gen we have mistakes as well, just mistakes happen as well. So by the time it ends up with QA, um, we've got incomplete stories, we've got incomplete designs, we've got designs that don't match what the code is, um, uh, we've got sort of um, uh, multiple sources of truth in JIRA stories, it ends up quite messy, from my experience anyway. <laughs> Um, and this just gets more complicated when you've got bigger organisations and you've got teams running in parallel. Not only do you have trouble within the teams, keeping consistency, but also between. How do you make sure all the UX designers uh, are, des are using the same components? How do you make sure that the developers um, are, are coding in the same way? And how do you make sure that QA are testing against one source of truth for, the, for all the products? So common occurrence without a design system so the initial designs look great, awesome cake, um, but then it goes through dev and it goes through um, accessibility and all these people, and then it comes to you on your desk and you see, you see that. <laughs> and somehow you've got to bring that back to that, and it's a big job, and it probably takes, <laughs> it's close, um, but it probably, it probably takes more effort than you'd want to. So we accept that requirements change and product, product, products pivot. That just happens. But design fundamentals don't need to change. So how do we make sure the initial designs reflect accurately what is being tested in QA at the end of the process? So design systems. Ooh. Um, uh, so what is a design system? Um, a design system is a living, breathing collection of reusable components guided by clear standards that can be assembled together to form products. I'll help you out with that a bit here. So, um, one of the thought leaders in design systems is Brad Frost. And the way that he thinks about these reusable, reusable components are in atoms, molecules and organisms. So atoms are you sort of this, the smallest component you can get. So that's buttons, text fields and text labels. And then, they, then those atoms become molecules, they join together to become molecules. So maybe a button, a text field and a text label will actually make a search bar. And then we've got more complex or, um, organisms which are sort of UI components, complex UI components. And that's something like a header or a footer or these kind of things. And then the whole scientific analogy goes out the window and we look at templates and pages. Um, and the templates are um, just how the components uh, fit together on, onto the page. And then pages is just when you've got all the fancy, nice images and all the text as well. 
So just to clarify that, so you can see the atoms here, um, maybe you've got an avatar, you've got a card, and you've got some text. They combine together to become a molecule, uh, which would be a, a contact card, and then further on as an organism, that's your contact list, and how that might look in a, in a template, and then how that might look in a page beyond that. So that's components, but a uh, design system is basically a website. Um, uh, it's got three main areas. You've got sort of design guidelines and principles. Um, you've got the uh, component library and you've got the resources. So the de design guidelines cover things like color, typography, uh, interaction design, icons, uh, spacing, visual form, illustration. So this is, a, this is Shopify's Polaris um, design system and you can see how they, they document color quite well here. Um, so it's all very well documented. And they do that for not just colors, but typography, icons, all that kind of stuff. And then you've got the component library. So this is just all the components you have across your whole organization, all your products. And they're all listed out here. But each, each um, component's been given a description, a title, obviously, button. Um, and, uh, and all the different variations, you might have a large button, a small button, a button with an icon, these kind of things. And then you get a live example of how that looks in the wild, in your products. Um, you've got how to use it, how not to use it, those kind of things. Uh, you have code snippets for the developers so they can just cheat and copy paste all the time. Um, and you've got a sandbox as well where you can actually just, they, devs can play around with it. So it actually becomes a really good tool to, to dev with, but also to test against. Um, and then the third part of it, you have resources. So you have onboarding, documentation, sketch libraries and design libraries and design kits for your UI designers. Um, and you've got sort of font libraries and icon libraries, image libraries. It just standardizes everything across a whole design system. So there's a lot of design systems out in the wild today, really. Like, uh, and so you can see that there's uh, Organizations are seeing great value in them. So you've got Atlassian, Salesforce, um, Shopify, Zendesk, um, Google Material there, MYB, all these kind of companies. So um, and it's, for these larger organizations, it's becoming sort of standard practice to have these um, in product development. So why do we need design systems? So to answer this, we'll take a look at some of the challenges facing um, product teams and, um, and organizations today. So one of the challenges is scale. As uh, organizations grow, um, you have more product teams, more product teams working on smaller things. Um, you know, maybe at Google, someone's just working on the header, for example. Um, so when you have more product teams, it's hard to get alignment, not only within them, as we spoke about before, but actually between them as well. So design system will provide that one source of truth that the designers are using the, the uh, components, the devs are coding in a certain way, and um, the QA are testing against that one source of truth. Uh, debt is another challenge. We all have, uh, we all build debt, um, technical and design debt, um, from being short sighted and not looking at products how we should. Um, and Design systems can help here because they keep that design and code overhead low. Um, you've only got a certain amount of components that you can use, like there's only five buttons and one calendar, all those kind of things. So it only contains that, the necessary components that are required for, for your organization. Uh, consistency, again, we were talking about that with the um, porcupine or echidna earlier. Um, but uh, as, t as teams grow and as organizations grow, uh, things get out of whack. Um, design consistency goes out the window. So design systems can help here. They standardize the components. Everybody's using them. And, um, and the guidelines as well, the design guidelines. And it's that one source of truth. Speed's a big one, actually. Um, so we're always got tight timelines. We're always trying to ship quicker. Um, design systems can help uh, the designers, especially. Um, uh, they have uh, libraries within their sketch files, and we can just drag and drop components. I think about 10 years ago when I was designing, we used to make these bespoke uh, solutions all the time. But now, like you're putting together designs a lot faster than we ever have. Um, uh, devs can work faster as well because they've got the code snippets within the design system as well. So either HTML or React or whatever the, the product um, needs. And then QA can um, uh, test more efficiently because there's that one source of truth. So it's, re it's really great. 
Um, accessibility, not much of, not a challenge, but just a focus that organisations have these days. Um, uh, I think it's really important that our products are all very accessible for everybody. Um, and design systems can help here as well because they can have clear accessibility guidelines that you can throw into the design system. Um, but you can also build accessibility in a, in a component level. Um, instead of a product level, because a lot of times um, we'll, we'll develop, we'll design something and we'll develop it and then we'll see accessibility and then we'll be like, nah, none of that, like you just start again. And it's, it's important that, um, that if we build it in a component level, the, the devs are confident that the, the components are uh, accessible, the, and QA is confident that they're accessible and also the designers as well. So it just gives confidence throughout the product team um, that they can, they can use these components without having a big conversation with accessibility at the end of it. So designing a design system, what's involved? So first of all, you want to build a team. And a lot of places start with UI designers and some finish with UI designers and they just have this amazing pattern library that designers can use and, and, um, and make all these, uh, and they're all aligned and they're all using the same components and that's great. But then they forget that it has, still has to go through dev and it still has to go through accessibility and risk and legal and you're still going to get that inconsistency as you go through. So the team has to be bigger than that. It has to be front end developers. You know, you need researchers to find out um, what the design system should be, really, who your customers are, those kind of things. Um, you want content strategists to nail the tone of voice. You want performance experts to make sure that the system runs well and is fast. And you want quality assurance to make sure that the components are robust and tested, and the design system robust and tested as well. And you want product managers to just run the show, really. So there's different models that you can use when you're doing a design system. There's a solitary model, the centralised model, and the federated model. So the solitary model is one person running the whole design system. Um, great for smaller organisations, you can really sort of, uh, get it done quite quickly. But the problems are that as the team grows and there's more product teams feeding into the design system, um, they can't keep up and it just doesn't scale. But it's great for smaller organisations. Um, the centralised model, I think, is a good one. Uh, it's, just, uh, it's when you just build a, a team to run the design system as their full-time job. Um, and this is well maintained usually. They, they do a good job because they're doing it as their full-time job. Um, but they've got a tendency to work in isolation. They're not talking to the product teams around them or, or the customers that are using the, um, the components in the products. So um, it can break down there if, if they're not careful. And then you've got the federated model. So this is when you bring, bring people from all, all around the organisation to come in and be part of the design system team. And this can be great because they're on the ground. They understand what quality assurance need out of a design system. They understand what developers need out of a design system. Um, uh, and so they have great insights. Um, and they're also closer to the customers as well. So they know what the customers want out of the components and the, and the visual style. Um, but they're usually too busy working in their product team, so the system usually breaks down or can break down if they're not careful. So just going back a slide, I think that the centralised models are best, but as long as the feedback loops there between um, the product teams and the customers back to the design system, then it works really well. So with any, any I'm a UX, so this is what I'll say, but with any product you need to do your research. And we consider the design system, a, a, it's a product. So you've got to identify your customers. So you, your customers of your design system internally are your designers, your developers, and your quality assurance teams. They'll be using it day in, day out. Designers will be, will be designing with it, the developers will be coding with it, and the quality assurance will be testing against it. Um, and then you have the external teams. Um, so you've got your end users, so the people that are actually using these components in your products. So you want to be testing with those guys as well. And third party sometimes, like if you're Google and uh, you outsource your design uh, system like Google Material um, to third party developers, you, you want to sort of hear their, their pain points and, and their, their thoughts about how the design system's going. So you want to test this is uh, usability testing and, and um, interviews. Um, so you want to test with your internal team. You want to find out how designers and devs and quality assurance people are working today, how they might want to work with the design system in the future, and any, any pain points they might have as well. And, and find out their processes and how they work and build the design system around that. It's going to help with adoption. 
Um, and then you want to, want to do usability testing too. So that's later on. You're going to have your first prototype at this point um, or, um, or your first cut at your design system. And you want to actually test this live with your designers, devs, and quality assurance teams to make sure they can work with it and they can, they can use it. And then I've got end users down there as well um, because you want to be testing those components. It'd be a separate test altogether, but you want to make sure that the components and the design and your style is resonating with your end users, customers. So design. So when you're putting the design system together, you need two main areas. You need your design guidelines and your component library. So your design guideline, we went through a little bit before, but it's, it's your colours, your typography, your spacing, your images and your visual form. So when we sort of look at that um, in relation to a component, so we'll have a button um, and that button's got a colour. So colour. It's got spacing, margin and padding around it. Uh, it's got visual form, shadows and round corners. And then we'll add um, a, a, a label. So that's got typography and it's got spacing around it as well. And um, then we might add, it's got a colour, and then we'll add an icon as well. Um, so that sort of covers off icon. So you can see you've really got to nail your design guidelines before you even tackle your component, component library. But when you do tackle your component library, you've got to look through your but you've got to design buttons, cars, lists, forms, accordions, all these things. Um, it's easy if you're starting from scratch for a new organisation or just a full rebrand. Um, it's tricky when you have to, you've got an existing organisation with, with their design styles, you actually have to go through an audit process and go, well, look at our 50,000 buttons we need, we just bring it back to five that we can manage. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's, too, that's, it's a nightmare, but you've got to do it. Um, building a design system. So this is, you've got to be, this is where the developers and the quality assurance teams are, are well involved in this process here. So it doesn't matter what you build your design system with. There's heaps of different tools out there and there's more and more coming out every day. Um, but it's important you get the foundations right of your design system. So you want it to be consistent, you want the design system to be self-contained, you, um, you want it to be, the components to be reusable, uh, you want it to be robustly tested, so that's where you guys come in, and accessibility as well. So consistent, um, so you just you want to define the rules of your system um, and clearly document the code, and you also use best practices, and that will just help with adoption. Um, you want it to be self-contained, so the design system should live separate from the main code base. Um, and this is really important, like, because as, you, as your design system matures, you'll get version one, version two, version three, but maybe a slower moving product team can't pick up, <coughs> can't pick up version three yet, they're still on version one. So it actually allows multiple teams to be across multiple versions of it, and it's still working. So. Um, and it also forces you to develop components in isolation, so no more sort of cowboys in product teams designing new components and, and, and styles. Um, uh, it's, it's all designed within the, in the design system and then fed out to the product teams. Uh, reusable, it's really important. So we talked about Brad Frost's uh, atomic design. So you want your components to be modular, composable, so you want to combine multiple com uh, components to make new components. You want it to be gen generic and flexible because your product teams will need it to be generic and flexible. They've all got different use cases for all this stuff. So you've got to have buttons that have different variations and accordions that um, work slightly differently if they need to be. So you, otherwise you just won't, the product teams just won't get invested in it. Um, accessibility, like I'm big on accessibility if you haven't noticed. Um, like it's important that all our products can be used by everybody and uh, design system allows you that place so you can have all your documentation on, on what accessibility means to your organisation. Um, but you can also build in best practices and you can also build in um, uh, accessibility at that component level instead of a product level. Robust, so you know it's important that these designs. If they're not robust, you're not going to get the adoption. People, if it keeps breaking, people will be like, "No, I'm not going to use this." So you got to you got to do the right test. So you want to be doing unit testing on this with Mocker, Jasmine, and Jess. You want functional testing with Nightwatch or Casper. Um, uh, visual regression testing with Apply Tools or Percy, and automated accessibility testing with Ali. So you've done all this work. You've You've tested. You've you've built it. You've bought. You built the team around it. Um, you've uh, you've designed it. You've built it. You've tested it. 
you want to make sure that people are going to use this. And so the, the trickiest thing to start off with is adoption. And I've sort of mentioned a couple of times, but like if no one uses this, it's not going to, it's not going to be a good product. So you want everyone to be using it. And so you can do this by having clear onboarding documentation um, for, um, for new people, but also people that are new to the system. Um, you want flexible design pattern libraries because designers still want to feel like they're creating things. Um, and if, if they're not flexible enough and they're trying to design in the, in the beginning, um, uh, they're not going to get. They're not going to uh, adopt the adopt the design system. You want clean, robust code. So again, has to be tested, um, and that's just because uh, if it keeps breaking, that's a problem. Um, you want ongoing design system rituals. So um, um, uh, I've been at places. I'm at NAB at the moment, um, um, where we do design pattern rituals, um, and um, so we'll go in, and if I've got an issue with one of the components. Um, I, can, I can actually see if I can get it fixed or maybe the design system team have a new idea for my product and how it's going to work. Um, and they're really great sessions and um, that's open to developers, quality assurance and um, designers. Um, and uh, give it a name. They all have funky names so it seems to help with adoption. I don't know. Um, and then there's upkeep. You've got to keep it alive as a living, breathing product. So you, you've got to give it the love that it deserves. You've got to keep expanding the system. You've got to keep testing the system and making sure that it's working and, and that you're doing all the right things for it. And that's why I think it's good to have that centralised model um, with the, with the full-time team. And then validation. Um, you want to be testing, validating and revising the design system all the time. Um, it can always be improved. Um, there's always feedback loops with your product teams, all those kind of things. Um, so you want to have regular usability, usability testing with your component library, with your end users. Um, you want regular usability tests on the design system itself. So, and then also regular interviews with your customers, that being quality assurance, devs and, um, and designers. Um, it's really important to have a roadmap for a design system as well. Internally for the design system team, that's great for um, motivation to keep going, but externally it's really good to communicate to the rest of the product teams about what components are coming down, down, the, down the line. So, yeah, tell them what's coming, map out the future of the design system, have a North Star for your design system, maybe it's Google, Google material, or maybe it's something totally different. But just ha have a North Star for, for the design system. Um, map out future releases and yeah, communicate the roadmap to um, every product team. So, in conclusion, um, even though we're miles apart, you know, UX on one side and QA on the other, um, I think it's really important that we find ways that we work together and we just, and actually become more efficient in the way that we work. And I think that design systems will help bridge that gap. <laughs>